This week, we have the final part of our interview with Moonwalker Alan Bean, which were conducted by Rick Houston in 2016. And today, we're also joined by Rick to talk about what, why, and how these interviews took place. Do you have any good Alan Bean memories? We'd love to hear them. Tell us via our social media pages at Space and Things Podcast on Threads, Instagram, and Facebook, via the contact form on our website, or by leaving a review on your favorite podcast platform. And please consider joining us on patreon.com forward slash space and things. But right now, it's time for episode 199 of the Space and Things Podcast. Oh my God. Space and Things with Dave Giles and Emily Carney. I'm Emily Carney. And I'm Dave Giles, and welcome to episode 199 of our podcast. I know, my brain just exploded seeing that number. (laughs) So we're still on a bit of a hiatus of weekly recordings to prepare for show 200 and beyond. So this is part three of three of Alan Bean interviews, which were conducted by friend of the podcast, and author Rick Houston. We suggest that you listen to episodes 197 and 198 before this one, but let's just get straight down to business with the legendary Alan Bean. Yeah, absolutely. So we're going to hear a lot about Pete Conrad in this one, who was his Apollo 12 commander and one of his best friends throughout his whole life. They met. Pete was his instructor at test pilot school and, uh, They're buried very close together at Arlington, and their friendship was very real. So let's, yeah, as you said, let's hear from Alan Bean. Roger 12. At what point did test pilot school become the goal? Was that something that you wanted to do from the outset, or did that develop over time? No, I wanted to go be a Navy pilot and land on aircraft carriers and all that stuff because I thought they were the best, as I told you. Since then, flying with other people is not true. So I graduate from flight training. There's probably a lot more to flight training than uh, there is because you go to advanced flight training. That's when you uh, leave the Pensacola area. And I went to Beville. I uh, did instrument flying and T-33s, uh, uh, jets, and then flew F-9 and F-2s, which is the first jet I flew, that I personally flew, and uh, you do gunnery and all that other than that airplane. Then you graduate from there, and you, you're assigned to a squadron. I went to VA-44 in Jacksonville, Florida. I show up, here they are, just transitioning from Banshees, F-2Hs, to F-9F-8s, Cougars. And they're going to go out of the Saratoga and shake it down, meaning the first cruise of it, in like six or eight weeks. So they say to themselves, we've got to get this guy, Bean, I hope he catches on fast, we've got to get him qualified to land aboard the Saratoga in eight weeks. So they start giving me a check out in the F-9, F-8. Uh, I can do that. They don't spend that much time. You know, I go out on a, just a regular flight. It's a single engine airplane, a single pilot airplane, but like the F-9, F-2 sort of. Flew on a couple of those flights around just to get familiar with the area. I go out on a formation flight or two, fly at night. Then they say, okay, let's quit doing that with him. They're off doing bombing and all that stuff. Let's start teaching him to land on an air, you know, on a field, field carrier landing in practice uh, with an LSO. We didn't have a light thing. We had a guy with a paddle, you know, where you'd say, yeah, you, yeah. you need to speed up, things like that. So uh, I started doing that in the F-9, F-8. I was doing so-so at it. I remember one of the good things that happened to me during this period was the executive officer of the squadron, the guy named Shuff. He came to me after it. He says, Alan, you've got a problem doing this carrier landing practice. You're waiting for this LSO to tell you what to do. You have got to uh, 
figure it out yourself. You can't wait for him to tell you you're slow. You've got to look at your airspeed and know you're slow and then speed up. You gotta fly the airplane and then maybe he can give you some advice. But you can't suddenly shift over and just do what he says. So I was making that fundamental mistake. And thank good to show totally. Because then I went out and I said to myself, well, I'm going to fly this thing like uh, they told me. And then uh, I'll watch the LSO as well and do what he says. He's the final authority. I started doing that and lo and behold, it was not a problem. Because, you know, I could fly the airplane. I just had given the job over to him. And so I did that. Then we go down to uh, Guantanamo Bay to practice bombing and things and practice night carrier operations down there over the water. And then it was a lot more dangerous because you're down around 200 feet in the dark flying this airplane, trying to get lined up over there to some little lights on the runway like the ship. And so um, that took all the brain power I had and skill to do that. So I go aboard ship, and when I'm aboard ship, you know, I'm there flying the F9, F8 and liking it, and it's a good forgiving airplane. I think I'm good. You know, I'm glad. I'm not so glad because that was the era they had F8Us, of course, uh, Crusaders, and they were fast and looked better and everything. I wanted to be Crusader pilot. Looking back on it, probably saved my life that I was. <laughs> yeah. Because the F9 F80 was a more forgiving airplane. You didn't have to be as good a pilot to fly that airplane as you did the Crusader. And a lot of people got killed in that Crusader. And it had an eye accident rate because it was harder to fly. If I'd have been there, questionable, and I would have lived through it. Wow. But the F9, F8, I could make more mistakes. And uh, uh, I didn't know it at the time. You know, I I knew that, but it didn't make any difference. I was too dumb. But uh, I would look around the ship and I'd think, boy, oh, they're flying FJs. I'd like to fly that. That looks fun. Now they're flying uh, Crusaders. That's the one I always wanted to fly. I, I, I wish I could fly that. And then whatever else they were flying on the ship at the time, you know, I would be thinking they were flying AD propeller airplanes. That'd be fun to do. And uh, it was along about this time that uh, I began to like really what I was doing. I was good at it. You know, when you're, you're, you're new, I'll tell you a good story about carrier land things. So we go out to the ship, the whole squadron goes out to the ship and we practice and I make landings and we make night landings, all that, you know, everything's great. We get on the ship now and we take off for where we're going to go on a cruise for six weeks. We live on the ship, you know, and I'm there with all the other pilots and I'm flying and liking it, you know. One day they decide, somebody decides to post on a big bulletin board, how are you doing on carrier landings? You know, did you make a boulder? Did you, uh, which means you landed long, or did you get a wave off? Well, whatever it was. So they post this. <laughs> I'm the only guy in the squadron that made a, a landing each time. Well, I didn't know this, because I wasn't keeping up with everybody else. But here I am, the new guy, and I'm the only guy in the squadron that hadn't had a boulder, hadn't had a wave off or anything else. Every time I came around to land, I landed. When I saw that, I couldn't believe it. The very next time I went out, I had to get a wave. <laughs> <laughs> See, I was not living up to my self-image. Yeah. Uh, to see me by self image <laughs> and so <laughs> I didn't even know that route for well. But that was what was going on in my head. How can I possibly be doing 
good that good if I have the new guy. Do you yeah. see? Yeah, oh yeah. Yeah. So anyway, I, I then fit more in the I wasn't so great after that. Because I began to my brain became began to think about other things like I wonder <laughs> I wonder if I could do this as well as I accidentally did. <laughs> anyway, that's yeah. That's, I remember that as as, as I, I was beyond my expectations and since learned that's a, a something that happens to people. They play a sport beyond their their uh, self image or what they do and so suddenly so they yeah. go back. Yeah. yeah. Anyway, I'm liking this and doing well and I'm wanting to fly these other airplanes and, and the skipper of the squadron is telling me that the Navy is a good place to be because I didn't know. One of the lucks of my life, I believe, is a couple of people I knew in the squadrons. One of them had a father that was, uh, had a car dealership in a big city. And I envied him because I thought, well, when he gets finished in the squadron here, he can go home to wherever it was, Chicago or something, and then he can go to work in his dad's car dealership. He'll have a new car every year. Yeah. Boy, that is what a lucky guy. I often wondered if my dad had a car, car dealership, if I would have gone home so I could have been had a new car every year and uh, sold cars and, and inherited the car dealership. But I didn't. And so I didn't want to go be an aeronautical engineer. I knew that. And I loved being in the Navy. So that thought of, well, well gosh, uh, I like to go fly these other airplanes. I'm going to fly for to be a test pilot, I looked into it, see, the commander of the squadron, Jack Taylor, he had been a test pilot years ago. He recommended it, probably wrote me a good thing. I didn't know enough about it. And so uh, I, I went off along with another fellow in the squadron who was probably the fair haired boy in the squadron, Jim Willis. We went off to, uh, you know, we're, uh, assigned to test pilot school. But then you do, then you've got to sign up for another four or five years. Yeah. But by then I realized that, that this is what I like to do. And I, I, boy, when I got to test pilot school, it was a test pilot. I thought for a guy like me, and it's true, I had the best job in the world for a guy like me. Yeah. For a guy that liked flying airplanes and wanted to fly them all. That was it. You couldn't get a better job. I went to work every day thinking, wow, this is the best job in the world for me. Did you meet Pete first or Dick first? I didn't meet Dick okay. until I was uh, selected as an astronaut. Okay, all right. Pete knew Dick. I think maybe he was in the same class, I'm not sure, at test pilot school, but then they were in the F-4 squadron together. I think it was the first Navy squadron to have F-4s. And so they got to be buddies there in that squadron. And then uh, it turned out, I think Dick was a little bit older than Pete and maybe had gone through a class before Pete. I'm not sure about this. Went to flight test. Then when they both went through the selection program, the Senate selection, just like I did, then Pete was selected, Dick wasn't, and I wasn't, and then Dick and I went through the third, and we were both selected in the third. Now, you touched on it a little bit, but what was your first impression of Pete? Well, he just was a good instructor, and he talked fast. You know, he didn't know me that particular. I was just a student in class, I guess. And then uh, one of the ways we kind of got interested in each other uh, during the uh, uh, test pilot school they take you uh, on the weekends usually to different uh, aircraft manufacturers and so he usually took us he flew the airplane 
And so I know there's some trim. You know, you got to know the guys and a little bit better because it was less structured, you know. And then in the evening, you'd go out and party a little bit. You know, we just like the things I thought about were the things he thought about. Alan, for me, it's easy to think of an introvert as, as being kind of meek and mild and, and certainly not somebody that's a, a, a daredevil jet fighter pilot. It, did you get a sense that when you were flying that maybe you were coming out of your shell a little bit, or was that just you doing your duty? No. Now, uh, your opinion of an introvert is shared by the majority of people. Yeah. An introvert is a person that is more comfortable with a small number of people, maybe one or two, and themselves. They're pretty much the same about everything else. They can be just as good an athlete as anybody else. They know they're different, but they don't see it as professionally a disadvantage. They don't know because... They can go compete. I can fly airplanes as good as anybody. Yeah. Well, not anybody, but more than most. And I've always been an invert. They said, according to uh, what I read about it now, I didn't know about it then, this, you suck, you're born that way. You will not change that. You are an introvert or an extrovert or somewhere along this line. Nobody's a complete extrovert not good. Nobody's a complete introvert. I'm over close there. I've not met anybody in my profession that's as close over there as I am. Neil Armstrong is over here somewhere, but he's not as far over as I am. Yeah. And uh, Pete understood this somehow. And so when I was working with Pete and Dick in general, I did went out after I get there. I enjoyed working with them. We were a good team, all three of us. And man, you can imagine we were. But then at the end of the day, then I wanted to get in my own car. I wanted to go eat by myself. I had to refuel that introversion thing. I had to get rid of all that social stuff. Yeah. After you and I finished talking for an hour here, then I had to kind of quit doing that. You see, yeah. I need to kind of be by myself, think about my own thoughts. Now, one of the problems is I was married to an extrovert. My first one. Yeah. So I would say, thank God I was, because she was the one that forced me to be more extroverted, which I needed to be to fit in better. Because if you're an introvert, then people think you're unfriendly. They think you don't like them. You do, but you don't want to get together with a bunch of them and talk about things. That wasn't the reason my first wife and I got divorced, but it was part of it. And once a month, she wanted to get together with people and, you know, the life. I did it. We never could, I didn't know how to solve problems then like I do now. So we never could really solve that problem. Right. And of course, I didn't understand myself then, and she didn't understand. So know the truth, and the truth will set you free. That was on the University of Texas Tower. I'm used to walk my Lord. I know it's biblical. I'd say, know the truth, and the truth would set you free. I never understood it there. I definitely understood it now, but I didn't understand it until I left NASA when I was constantly working on learning to uh, be a good astronaut. That's what I thought about every day, and somehow putting up with the monthly parties and getting together. Now, the last time that we talked, you said that Pax River was the best job that you'd ever had, and you couldn't imagine anything being better. But then the space program comes along, and, and I've read where you said something, something to the effect of rockets were louder and faster and climbed higher and so forth. So you wanted to be an astronaut. It seems like you continually want to push that envelope. I do. I wanted to be as great as I could be. I wanted to fly the 
fastest planes, the ones that were most difficult to fly, things like that. It was a desire to be, you know, really good. So when the straight A program came along, it, I, there it is. You know, I'm doing as good as I can in the Navy. I'm flying the best airplanes. I'm, old, I'm good at it. Uh, wow, here, look, man, they fly higher than faster than I do. And it's more complicated. And going into the moon in a spaceship is more complicated than flying airplanes, I'm sure. I need to go do that. Do you see, I didn't have an urge to explore space or really, you might say, walk on the moon. I had the urge to fly the spaceships that could go there and land on the moon. Then while I'm there, I could get out and do whatever they want me to do. <laughs> but there I can get back in and fly back up, rendezvous in space with another spaceship. Wow, they're going 18,000 miles or 9,000 miles an hour around the moon. But wow, I could learn to do that. That would be fun. I lived my whole life be having fun. Really. That, you notice I naturally said, I'm over there painting because that's fun. If that weren't fun, I would quit and start thinking about what would be fun. Then I need to get good enough at that so that I can get, make a living. I understand these uh, athletes that don't want to stop. Being quarterback or right guard or defensive back since they were kids, they loved. If they didn't, they'd quit. And they love it, and then suddenly they can't do it anymore, maybe. Well, maybe they can do it with a different team. They don't want to give it up. I don't, I don't blame them. I didn't want to give up piloting except that I was training to fly the shuttle. That would be fun. However, I felt like I needed to do this because this was something that only I was interested in doing. And I could leave a legacy, whereas if I'd flown in the space program, it'd be fun. But they can do that without me, and indeed they've done it. And now I'm over here doing a job I believe is important. So it feels good. You know, I don't have to work this hard. I like it. That's what I like to do. That's me. Now, was applying to the astronaut office something that you and Pete discussed, or was that a conclusion that, that each of you came to you to on your own? No, I think we came to it. Probably didn't even know. My thinking was, uh, all along, everybody wants to do this. Because I wanted to, okay? Yeah. There's a thought when you're young that everybody sort of wants what you want. Fortunately, they don't. They want something else you don't even know. They wonder why. And so uh, you're sitting there and you read the thing saying uh, they're going to take new. If you're in the Navy, you've got to apply. Well, I better go apply. You know, you don't wander around trying to get other guys to apply. Maybe if you're an extrovert, you do. An <laughs> introvert, you don't. You yeah. do that. You go back to trying to test your airplane. Then you find out about uh, it's sort of, well, I wonder how many Navy guys. Someone says, uh, 300. I have no idea. 300. Well, I hope, uh, I don't know what that means. I wonder how many NASA wants to look at. And so then they send a certain number to NASA, let's say Navy, Air Force, Army, or this way. If you're a civilian, you can just uh, apply directly to NASA. But in the Navy, you can't do that. You've got to apply to the Navy to do that. Then the Navy looks at it, and they say, okay, we've got, I'm inventing this number, a thousand people, maybe, but NASA only wants us to give us 30. So we'll look at these thousand, we'll have a board, you know, like the promotion. We'll pick the 30 and we'll present them to NASA. Something like that. Maybe it's a hundred. And then suddenly you get a notification from NASA, the Navy has uh, submitted your name. We'd like you to come to, uh, in our case, we went to the Air Force medical place over at San Antonio. I've forgotten the name of it. And undergo a week of uh, physical and psychiatric tests. Of course, that was good. Then maybe 
And then you find out that that's the final. So there's a total of 32 there, maybe. That's kind of what I remember. So that was the first time around? That's the first time okay. around. That's the first time around. Okay, and so uh, you go there, and then you see these other people. And then probably Dick Gordon was there. I didn't remember him. Yeah. He, Conrad was there. I did remember him. But when you're there, you're really by yourself. You know, you see them at the end of the day, maybe. But as you get there at 8 in the morning, and they're giving you at the first of the week. This is about as well-organized thing as I'd ever been at. You have this form, okay, on Monday, 8 o'clock, go to kidney function. So you get there waiting for kidney function, which you don't even know what that is. And the guy walks out, Lieutenant Bean, yeah, okay, uh, let's do this test. So they go in and you got no idea what the hell they're going to do. But they do a bunch of stuff. And then whenever it's finished, which turns out they've allowed 55 minutes for kidney function, you walk out the next event at 8.55 is... uh, Hearing ballots or so, the guy standing there, and you walked out. He carts you over to hearing ballots. You go do it. When you get finished, you look on your thing. The next thing is such and such, some kind of aisle of test you've never had in your life. You don't waste three minutes. Yeah, they meet you and cart you off to eyeball tests, and this goes all this way till noon. And so you're going. Everybody's doing everything. You sell, or maybe you pass them, but you've got other things on your mind. Yeah. One of the things I remember about it, which was kind of fun, is I would ask them how I did. I wanted my kidney function. I wanted them to say, you've got the greatest kidney <laughs> <laughs> They never did. They would say, Oh, they're normal. You know what? I'd be a big disappointment because I wanted to have special kidneys. (laughs) And that was everything. I mean, we're not talking. (laughs) But that was the way it went. (laughs) Then in the afternoon, then you had lunch. Went to lunch. Yeah. Now somewhere, maybe you'd see people. But you didn't bother with them. You've got your own problems here. Plus, I'm an introvert. Astroverse probably got together and talked it all. I did. And uh, one of the decisions I made both times, I felt I would be a good astronaut. I felt like my characteristics and skills, uh, that's just everybody thought that, okay? But I said, I'm going to play this thing straight. I'm going to just tell them the truth. That's me, I would and tell it like it is, like I think, and let it go. Very interesting to me. It wasn't interesting. By the way, was the afternoon. The afternoon was first maybe an hour and a half was a psychological test with a machine, maybe, that was like a cockpit. And then they gave you training period. For example, they said, okay, now, for the next three minutes, every time that red light lights, you throw this switch. And every time the green light lights, you twirl this knob. Okay, then they do that for three minutes. Okay, now, put on those earphones, and when you hear an A on code, then you punch that button. And then when you hear something else in code, you do this. They give you three minutes doing that. And then they do the two of them together, okay? Then they would do another. Who knows what the hell it was. <laughs> and of course, you realize that they're seeing how fast you catch on, and then they see how fast you can get overloaded. They can overload you quite easily. They're running the speed of this thing, and how you react when you're overloading. So you know this, but yet you want to be the very best. You want to... You know, I want to be the best they'd ever seen. So, of course, you're not. I never was, but that is the way I wanted. So I would do that. Was that was half the afternoon? Then the other half of the afternoon, which I really liked, but most other guys didn't, was now you talk to a psychiatrist. This usually takes a couple of hours, 
And so they're psychoanalyzing. And they start out talking about your time with your mother and dad when you were small. And you spend those two hours, how did you like your mother? Do you remember what was the special thing about it? Who was the most important, your mother or dad? You know, I've forgotten all the things they did, but I enjoyed that. I enjoyed uh, thinking about that sort of thing. I still do. I'd go home at night, you know, after eating, I'd go back to the uh, BOQ where we stayed and do something or other. And then maybe maybe other guys went out to See, I didn't do that. Got a good night's sleep. Then I would think about that psychological business. And usually what happened for me is several things that I told them that afternoon, I thought about it more and thought, you know, I don't really think that. So the next day when that started, I would say, now let me tell you, it was a different guy there. It was a different guy each by there, and a different machine each day. So then the different guy, he wanted Dan to talk about elementary school and junior high and high school, maybe. But she talked about the bird. I'd say, wait a minute. You know, I told this guy that. I don't think that's true. I've always said it to myself, but now that I've said it aloud, I don't think I think that. I think this. So maybe there'd be two or three things that I would tell them. Then we'd do whatever it was. Then the next day, maybe, when they're talking about college, I think, and then after college, they showed you these cards. These are standard cards. And they had their images on them. And uh, these images are about different age ages. So here's a picture of a young boy. And then there's the father standing near him, and the father is very sad about something. And the little boy is sad. And, you know, your job is to look at it and tell us, tell the story. And what happens is, they believe it, I do too, you end up kind of telling stories about yourself. Because that, or those are the stories you know. So when you tell stories of some of my favorite one, I don't remember what else I told them there, was they have this guy college age, and he's come to the door and opened his room door, and there is his mother. And looking behind him, you can see the girl in bed, and she's partially clothed. You've got to tell this story. So I think I never had that experience exactly, but uh, so I told the story. You know, it was obvious story, you know, <laughs> and I used all the words that that came to mind. And his mother comes in, and she looks sad, by the way. <laughs> and the kid looks sad. You know, <laughs> the kid is sad. I said, I don't know why he's sad. People that age do do this sort of thing. And you wouldn't even be here if your mother didn't do this stuff. I had no mind advice to think about what the true would do. So I remember doing that. The last one is this blank card. And I took the blank card and I talked about it. I wouldn't know what I said. But Pete looks at it and he leans over and grabs it and says, you've got it upside down. And he turns it. <laughs> Life's not going to answer this story. And that's a famous story yeah. among the... Uh, he thinks that that's why he was... He went through the first selection, or the original seven. And he thinks that's one of the reasons he wasn't selected in the original seven. I think it was because he was younger. So, kind of like me. And Dick Gordon, well, I don't know about Dick. But they sent me back, I think, to... Well, maybe we don't need him. He's young. We'll look at him later, maybe. They don't tell you this, but that's what I think must have happened. But anyway, that was fun. And then their carry to all this was we're leaving at the end of Friday. This is a solid week of this. And I'm walking out the steps of the hospital, and here comes Colonel Flynn or Flynn or something like that. I don't remember his name. Up the stairs with a bunch of folders under his arm. And he was the guy that was in charge. And uh, he said, well, thank you know, thanks for coming. Is there anything uh, you wonder about? And I said to him, how did I do the psychological evaluation? 
he gets out a folder, looks through, you know, and he's, he's with another officer, hands in the folders, look through. He said, we put you in the top three, okay? This was a shock to me because I knew I was quite a bit different, but all of a sudden they are saying I'm psychologically really good, okay? Yeah. But I thought about it a lot, and that information changed me quite a bit because then I had more confidence in what I thought as opposed to what I imagined other people thought. So let's say I'm at service test, and somebody says, well, Lieutenant Bill Smith, uh, he got passed over for Lieutenant Commander. And then the other guys around would be saying, how sad, gee, that's too bad, he's a great guy. And I would say, if I thought it, so, which I wouldn't have done before, yeah, <laughs> he's been a nasty guy since I got here. Yeah. And I don't like him. I don't think he's a good naval officer. I'm glad they kicked him, you know, didn't pass him over. They were looking at me like, who the fuck is being? Yeah. They probably thought it too, see. But they didn't find out that what they thought was okay to say. And so that changed me, really, even to now. Because it gave me a license to be who I was, naturally. And, and so I, I've been that way since then. And it's got me in trouble. I'm sure it got me in trouble with Al Shepard and some other high guys because they said, Al shouldn't talk like that uh, about it. I think so too, but he shouldn't do it. You see what I mean? It can get you in trouble if you don't weigh carefully whether you should uh, say what you think, honestly think, or say what the group thinks you ought to think. So I wasn't very good at that sort of stuff. Yeah. It got me in trouble and master at first because I do it the other way. It, it fits me. It's okay. I do that now because I can do it. But if I had it to do over a NASA gear, I wouldn't do that. I would be more careful and circumspect and just keep some of that to myself. There's no reason to do that if you've got moss that feels differently. And, you know, you can tell if it feels differently. Good idea to shut the f*** up. That's what I would recommend. <laughs> to fact, when I briefed some new astronaut candidates, I said, you want to listen to what Al Shepard and Deke Slayton say. Well, that is true about bosses. Bosses want you to do what they want you to do. You might be able to say, I think I'm doing this, and it seems important. What do you want me to do, Al? But if he says, well, interesting, but I want you to wash my car, which you would, but let's say he did, I yeah. wouldn't have done it then. I don't argue with it. Yeah. But now I would say, okay. Is there anything special about the shop? You, you want me to wax it? Yeah. <laughs> That's what I recommend doing if you've got a boss like Al Shepard. Other bosses, they would listen and say, it's okay, uh, okay, why don't you finish that up and then wash my car? You see what I mean? Yeah. You've got to pay attention to what your boss is like. Uh, we're we're a little past our hour time limit, but you said you had an important story about something. Um, oh yeah, I know. I'm worried for story. Okay, let me tell you a story. This is a good story, and it does show you. And I'm proud of the story, but this shows you me. I go over to service. By the way, I believe Pete sat in on and told me this that when they were assigning. Things show how important Pete has been in my life, maybe even more important than I know. Yeah. Because he never said, I went to Deke Slate and told them that they ought to take you as an astronaut. He probably did, but he never said that to me. So I don't know. But whenever they were deciding where test pilots go from test pilot school, they were sending me over to weapons test, which was the big place there 
he said that he told them, look, you know, Alan's good, but he'd get lost over in the weapon steps. Probably true. A lot of pilots over there. You need to send him to service steps. And they did, see. And I was in a much smaller organization. That was a good thing, although I didn't know that for later years when he mentioned it. He mentioned that to me two or three times over the years. So I'm pretty sure he did that. He was the guy that told me the things that weren't right. And he recognized that I didn't get in a certain kind of organization. By the way, that's a different story. That's just a story about Pete. So I have a service steps. I'm thinking, I've got to fly the F-4 or the A-5 because those are the planes that are the Mach 2. I want to do that. I get in there. They don't give me that assignment. They give me some other assignments, testing a, a troll, A-4, a, a, a replaceable troll or something like that. And about this time, we have about four or five pilots killed in ejection seat missiles for a variety of reasons. These new planes, people don't know how to rig them right, you know, get to all the things connected. You know, they're new, just like the airplane. One of them was an 85, the guy from weapons test, he's flying a low pass over the water and his control system goes out. They had a special control system adaptive control system in there that didn't have any regular airplanes. And the hand bugs, if people can't think of all these things. And uh, he's going, he, he suddenly did, sees he doesn't have any control. And so he's got to eject. And this ejection seat is designed to eject it with Mach 2. And the way it does, you've got, because I flew the A5 after that a lot, You've got a special suit, and you've got cuffs, and a cable that runs to here that go on cuffs, and things that come out. So when you inject, pull up the handle, it pulls your hands in here so they don't flare around and break, and they pulls your legs back, and they pull him back in there, and then they didn't eject it. So... Here he is in this airplane that's out of control down low. Well, it does a couple of these and then goes into the water. He gets killed. But Skipper of the service test comes to me and says, Alan, you've got to do something so that we don't have this problem. You see, we didn't have the problem. But service test and flight test had lost about four or five people in about two or three weeks. I didn't want that job. I wanted to be flying those airplanes. I'm a test pilot. I don't want to go down and run the the uh, parachute ejection seat guys. So it took me a couple of days to get my head out straight, and I said, okay, how can I look at this so I do it and have a good attitude? And I said to myself, you know, I've always wanted to be a leader, and I don't, I've never really been in a position to lead people. You know, I've been a pilot. You don't lead other people that much. That's the beauty of it. Okay, I'm going to learn to be, this is a chance for me to learn leadership. I start reading books about leadership. I start reading the books that they read about how to charge a flood on the airplanes how to pack a parachute. You know, I, I get into it. I want to do something else, but that is my son. So I'm doing this. And I'm learning this. And I'm working at it. And I'm leading these guys. I do the things. I call them in and call them with them, tell them about the goals of the Navy. You know, whatever I think this group needs. Okay, then, this is me too. I'm thinking well, I was sent down here. I've got my guys working hard here. Maybe there were 30 guys. I don't know how many guys there were. I don't know if I'm really solving this problem. And then I realized after looking into it that all these different airplanes had different details of how to check the ejection seat. So here's the pilot. He's flying an F-4 now. He looks at the ejection seat. 
Maybe he knows what should be connected right. However, later in the afternoon, he flies an A-5. So I say to myself, there's got to be a way that a pilot can look at this using principles of safety that he could use for all. So I then go through all, talking with the experts, and, and I come up with ch a different checklist than what the Navy has for each airplane. And they follow a principle. Every jet agency has to do certain things. I invented a checklist for each one that had those principles outlined. All right, so I did that for all the airplanes. So I go in, and I'm very nervous about this, uh, being the kind of guy I am, but I give the, I give the presentation to all our pilots at service tests, and I put these checklists alongside the other checklists in every airplane on every ejection seat. So as you're crawling in, I recommend that you look at this checklist, which explains what each of these do. And if you make sure that these do this, you will have a good ejection seat. So that was stressful for me because I had to convince these pilots to do it. Most of where I'm the new guy, by the way. Yeah. Very old pros. So I, that's it. I'm glad it's over. I've done what I could do. So the skipper came to me and said, this is a good thing. I want you to give this briefing to every, you know, flight test, test pilot school and weapon stage. You know, I'm the new guy, plus that bothers me anyway. Yeah. So I go to do it, and I'm glad it's done. I think they probably used the checklist for a while. Some did, some didn't, like everything else. I don't know. I did what I could. Yeah. Then a year or so later, I'm doing duty as the Hatch River duty officer over Christmas. I'm there, and the Navy puts out his promotion list on gifts from a Christmas. I don't know what duty. And I'm reading this thing just for the hell of it. I'm not due to be promoted for two years. I'm looking at it, and here I am promoted two years early from lieutenant to lieutenant commander. I don't know a single person in the Navy before or since that got promoted two years early as a lieutenant. Wow. That's what I said. I get promoted two years early. I never even heard of it. I didn't know it was possible. Yeah. Okay, I just keep going. I get promoted. That's a good deal. People congratulate me. I don't know what they're saying, obviously. Anyway, I run into the skip of this squad of the mid-service test after I'm an astronaut about a couple of years. And I'm chatting with him. Glad to see. He said, you know, Al, uh, you don't know this. But the second time you applied to be an astronaut, I was on the selection committee to select which names we gave to NASA uh, is what we recommended to be an astronaut for this. He said, I was there, and I made sure that we submitted your name. He said, because as a young officer, you did the best job for me that any young officer had ever done. And I thought to myself, you know, he didn't do that because I was a great test pilot. He did that because of what I'd done in the parachute and ejection seat world. He didn't say that. But looking back, that was the thing that made the difference to him. Wow. And I did do a special job. I described it. Yeah. Do you see, you have no idea of what's <clears throat> going to happen. He's on the board. If he hadn't been there, the Navy might not have submitted me in the Navy, he, I'd never be an astronaut. I yeah. really ended up in the Navy, which would be great. I'd have been over fighting in uh, Vietnam. I could have gotten killed or captured. Who knows yeah. what would I believe that was something that has helped my career a lot. 
is I've been able to find a way to make whatever I was inside important to me so that I wanted to do it. So it meant a lot to me. It wasn't me walking over there and saying, I just got to do this and get back to the job I want. When I was shifted over to Skylab and I wanted to be in the pop and sent to Skylab because me and Al Shefford, I said, I've got to find a way to lie off this. Yeah. I don't like it, but I've got to find a way so that I can like doing this. And I've always been able to do that. That's a gift of some sort or just the attitude to do it. Yeah. Because I didn't bitch about it. I didn't bitch about it. I said, I'm going to be as great as I can be over in Skyland. I really want to fly to the moon, but I'm not going to bitch about it. And I didn't. I just went over there and tried to be great as I could. And it was my personality, which you can see sometimes that's not not an advantage. Yeah. And he saw me do this ejection seat thing also. He never brought it up. But he, I was sure I was briefing him about ejection seats. And so he said, you know, Al B, pretty smart. He thought all this. I know they really didn't want to be doing it. But he's over here. Made a drill improvement to ejection seat procedure. Maybe save a life or two. Maybe he did it. You know, he's a pretty good guy. Because otherwise, he wouldn't have known any of this. No Air Force guy knew that. No Navy. Dick Gordon didn't know we could think about this. So you see, maybe that was a turning point in my life. Because I said I got to get a good attitude about this. And I did get a good attitude. I am able to get a good attitude about me. I'll yeah. tell you that. Yeah. I work at it. Whatever it is. Anyway, I blow my own heart enough. <laughs> but I think those are things people might be saying. How did Alan Bean ever get to be an astronaut? He didn't do that great. Yeah. Well, maybe not. But looking at Ian, and I can think of things more. That's the more I've said that before. I've got a Ability. Well, look at the things I've thought about in this in the whole career. Yeah. No, that's my gift. There's a lot of other things that are my gift. Might have been to me. Alan, thank you so much for your time. He's got it made. Come on in there. 24 feet. Contact light. Roger. Copy contact. Drop. Pro. Yeah, pro. We get both legs for the so that was the final part of the excellent interviews with Alan Bean, and now we're joined by Rick Houston, who conducted those interviews back in 2016. Rick, how did these interviews come about, and, and what was the intention? Well, the, the first intention was to do a book on Apollo 12, uh, but I, I knew up front that there would be some challenges uh in that i knew of course that that pete conrad had passed and then dick uh, gordon uh was still around but you know he was kind of iffy about being involved and and that kind of thing so as alan and i continued to talk and he told me his story i just really became really convinced that this would make a, a really good book about Alan, but not necessarily a, a straightforward biography. Uh, as, as people have heard in these interviews, he considered himself an extreme introvert. And when we started talking about that, I, I, was, I felt an immediate connection because I'm an extreme introvert. Uh, I'm most comfortable doing my own thing and not necessarily in a huge, huge group of people. Now, I can do those things. Obviously, I can go out in public, but when I do, you know, do an interview, for instance, I actually have to decompress from doing an interview. You know, I have a NASCAR podcast now, and and interviews are a big part of that. And, you know, but when I do those interviews, I, I have to decompress. My co-host and I, we do what we're doing now. We record our parts. 
And, you know, when I get done with that, I'm, I'm, I'm done talking for the day. Yeah. You know, my wife kind of gives me a hard time and says, I do 70 to 80% of the talking that I do during the week on the podcast. <laughs> but as, as far as Alan goes, I really, really wanted to do something with him uh, because if he could accomplish what he accomplished as a fighter pilot, as a test pilot, as an astronaut, walked on the moon, commanded Skylab, if he can do those things as an introvert, what's possible for the rest of us? That's the project that we ultimately wound up discussing uh, but just didn't get a chance to do it. Was there anything that really surprised you over the course of the interviews, either in what he said or how he was with you personally? I, I think the biggest surprise was was the fact that he was so open and honest about his uh, about being an introvert. And he said, you know, he would go out with Dick and Al, but he would also excuse himself to go back to the room and just kind of be by himself. And, you know, when he told those kinds of stories, yeah, I, I really identified with him. And, and did you have a, a working title for the book or, or, or anything? It got that far? Oh, yeah. I had a working title. It was something along the line. Well, it was actually an introvert's guide to conquering the galaxy. Oh, nice. <laughs> yeah. So that was the Alan Bean story. Very cool. Obviously, it, it, it didn't end up happening which is um, which is very sad, uh, and we're thrilled that we're able to present these interviews. And thank you again for, for letting us use them. Um, but I, I have to ask, Rick: Are there any other space projects on the horizon for you? Because it feels like it's been a while. <laughs> um, no, not not that I know of. I would never say no to one. Living in Yakimville, North Carolina, out in the middle of the country in North Carolina, you know, it's not the easiest to have connections in the NASA world. Uh, but I would never say no. I have, you know, Keith Haviland and I have, have kind of talked, teased in the past uh, about doing a, a Rick Houston cut of the Mission Control documentary. Oh, wow. Wow. Uh, well, kiddingly, you know, he says that if I had my way, the documentary would have been 27 hours long <laughs> uh, because I didn't want to cut anything out. Honestly, you know, I would love to see, you know, us do a director's cut, maybe a, a commentary uh, on oh, nice, this yeah. documentary with, with some of the guys. You know, the 10-year anniversary is still another, I guess, couple, two or three years away. But I, I think that the time to record that commentary uh, would be sooner rather than later because of the people that we featured in the Mission Control documentary. Yeah. Uh, several have already passed on. So, you know, I, w I would like to be able to do a, a, a commentary track on that. And as far as book ideas, I always have book ideas. <laughs> uh, but finding a publisher is, is the trick. Yeah, of course. Well, well thank you once again for, for letting us use these interviews and putting them out. We've had such incredible feedback. We've had some wonderful messages, people getting in contact with their stories of how they met Alan Bean. We had a Jeff, great one from Jeff who, uh, who told us all about how uh, he stayed up to watch the Apollo 12 launch as a kid jacked himself up on far too much coffee and nearly had to go in <laughs> sick the next day and was uh, quite mad at Alan and then ended up telling him that story <laughs> and Alan apologized, which uh, is, quite, is quite wonderful. But Well, you know, I've got a, I've got a voicemail on, on my phone from Alan. No way. And I will never, ever, ever delete that. Uh, it's actually survived through, I guess, three phones now, uh, which is a miracle in and of itself. <laughs> I'll never erase that that message, not just because of, you know, Alan being a moonwalker and everything, but he truly was a a really special guy. It's great Absolutely. to hear. So thanks again, Rick, and hopefully we'll speak to you soon. And if that commentary ever comes out, let's get you on again and talk a bit more about that, shall All we? All right. Sounds good. Streaming the titans of space history and giving voice to all cosmic explorers, this is is the Space and Thanks podcast. Well, that's it for this week and the end of our three-part Alan Bean special focus. Next week, it's show 200 and it's a special one. Yes, we've got our biggest guest yet. Uh, thank you for joining us this week and to all of those of you who have helped out. Uh, we have just picked our monthly Patreon book prize winner. So if you're a member, head on over there to find out if you've won. 
anyone can join in the fun. Just head over to patreon.com slash space and things to get your name in next month's draw. And don't forget, in space, no one can hear you me. This has been the Space and Things Podcast with Emily Carney and Dave Giles.